Will you do it? Good afternoon. Yes, it's a real pain. We are getting ready to start here. I am Len Sassaman, otherwise known as Rabbi. I've spoken in the past couple of DEF CONs about various remailer operator and uh, remailer technology issues. And one thing that always overwhelms me is the number of just general questions and answers we get at, at, during the Q&A session um, about topics that I hadn't anticipated in my talk. So this year we're going to do something a little different. We basically have a panel here of a few of the prominent remailer operators. And we're going to introduce them, tell a little bit about our backgrounds, and then uh, take questions from the audience. You guys are going to steer this, this session here. A little bit about my background. I've been a cyberpunk crypto researcher-ish person for about 10 years now. Um, I've only recently gotten into anonymous remailers. That actually was a uh, due to a DEF CON talk from a few years ago where one of my fellow panelists presented about her experiences with anonymous remailers, which finally inspired me to stop just being a user and actually get into operating them. I had followed the discussions about remailer development for many years, but never really realized how challenging and interesting a field this was. Aside from the technical aspects, there are a lot of operational aspects that really complicate the job of running a remailer. And we'll talk about that a little today, too. With me today is Robin Wagner, a longtime remailer operator and now a lawyer specializing in anonymity, that sort of privacy issues. Um, Ryan Lackey is next to her. Ryan has the distinction of having had a, an extra jurisdictional area to run a remailer, was able to field certain abuse issues differently than the rest of us. He's now doing Medicolo, which is a company that does multiple extra jurisdictional colos. Mike Shin, the operator of the, uh, not only a remailer operator and a longtime remailer operator from the early to mid 90s, I believe, but also runs the remailer operators list, which he'll tell you more about, where the various remailer operators, many of whom don't actually like each other or agree with each other, gather to discuss the operational aspects of the remailer network. And finally, at the end, Peter Palfreder, who is assisting me with development on Mixmaster, the anonymous remailer software. He is also one of the remailer operators. Fairly low-key, doesn't make it known that he's running a remailer, but has been for some time. So, I've been running a remailer since mid-2000. In mid to late 2001, took over the, the maintainer and development role for Mixmaster, which was unmaintained for several years. So now I am actually continuing to run my remailer and working on the software development side of it, which poses two entirely different set of challenges, but it has been rewarding. I've dealt a lot with various abuse issues, law enforcement, relationship challenges, user uh, advocacy aspects, and simply technological and um, logistical problems with various other people who have been trying to attack the remailer network in a number of different ways, which we can talk about if you're interested in. I'm going to hand this over now to my other panelists who will introduce themselves, and then we'll find out what you guys want to hear about. Robin. Okay, so I significantly prefer noise. I, I'm supposed to kill you now for using my real name. Um, I am very sorry. <laughs> I just like it better. Well, yes. It only works. So I gave a talk at DEF CON 8 on anonymous remailers. Um, I was absolutely terrified when I gave the talk. I'm a little less terrified now. I'm also now an attorney. Which makes this all very interesting, because when I talked to DEF CON 8, I could just blather on and say, well, I think this is the case, and mumble, mumble, and I'm an attorney. So I have to tell you 
Well, what I'm about to say may or may not constitute legal advice, and here's a disclaimer, and don't ask me any incriminating questions during the panel because it would be bad, and there's all these things that come with being an attorney. But the side effect of being an attorney is I'm an attorney, and I get to work on anonymous remailer things, and that's really cool. Um, it's especially cool to me because while I run an anonymous remailer, which I did since the mid-90s, like Mike Shin, I never really had any problems which was really sad to me as a law student because I was all ready. I was like, please, someone give me a subpoena. Please, please, Mr. Fed, come knock on my door. I'm ready. And they never came. <laughs> they all went to Len instead. So I guess all I can say right now is I am hoping that someday we will actually have an anonymous remailer case because we, we keep designing these systems saying, well, if it ever you know, happened, we think maybe the logs, if we don't keep logs, okay, well, that's great, you know, it's subpoena proof. We just make all this stuff up, but we've never really had an actual court case that's actually gone anywhere using the current technology. We just kind of make it up as we go along. So I will hand it over to Ryan now saying, if there are any feds in the audience, maybe give us a year and then, well, hypothetically, I'd really like a lawsuit. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Ryan Lackey. Um, I've run a remailer since 2000 and been a user since uh, Pennant days in a long time ago. And uh, among other things, I started at Haven Co., ran a remailer there without the approval of anyone else in the company, which um, was uh, very interesting, and I'll tell you more about it on Sunday. Uh, uh, and um, now I run another remailer. Uh, I have some data centers in other places around the world and do pretty much the same thing. Um, and I haven't really had any problems running a remailer. The worst thing that's happened to me has been um, there were some IRA people that were sending bomb threats and they sent notices to the City of London Police. And uh, then the City of London Police contacted me all a flutter asking me to figure out how this person sent the message. And I've had lots of civil complaints, but like companies and lawsuits and stuff. And the things that cause the most complaints are legitimate uses of the remailer. Like, this boss is stealing money from the company and somebody reports it, that's the kind of thing that gets the legal cases that I've seen or the legal threats. Not the like really offensive stuff like I'm gonna kill and dismember your children or whatever. So uh, yeah, um, I will turn this over now to Mike Shin. I think this microphone works, yeah. So uh, I'm Mike Shin, I've been running a remailer since uh, I guess the mid 90s. We were trying to figure out when. Um, I, God, I love your noise. It's so hilarious to have you on the panel. Um, I have been sued a few times, but they never go to trial thanks to our good friends at the ACLU and Epic, who have been fine enough to represent me in the few cases where this has happened. And it's always corporations. It's never bomb threats. It's never anyone getting killed or being threatened to be killed. It's this employee said this bad thing about my company. So. Uh, that's pretty much been my experiences so far, although I will mention at least one time I've been subpoenaed by the federal government for a bomb threat, thanks to our good friend, the Patriot Act. So, uh, you know, we do tend to get a few lawsuits occasionally. Yeah, I have actually been subpoenaed or sent a notice that I was supposed to appear in federal court, but I was out of the country at the time, so <laughs> I sort of told them to fuck themselves, and then the trial was over, and I came back to the country, and it was all cool. So. Yeah, unlike the rest of us that live in the United States, we actually had to respond to that. And the answer is simply what it always is. We don't have any logs, and this is the way the remailer works. And so far, we've never ended up with a case that went to trial. Uh, everyone always walks away, including, uh, I, I have to at least say something positive about the, uh, the feds. So far, the federal agents that I've uh, been uh, approached by have all sort of responded positively to the fact that, well, this is the way the technology works and we don't have any evidence to help you. And they have walked away. They've said, all right, well, we understand that. So for what it's worth, uh, even though the Patriot Act says they can get a lot of information, uh, the technology seems to work well enough that they're willing to walk away with nothing. And I will turn this over to Peter, who is uh, one of the developers on Mixmaster, and he also happens to uh, run a remail. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, uh, I've been running a remailer since I think 2002. No, 2000. And well, it doesn't. It isn't in the U.S. It's located in Germany. Even though I'm Austrian, I've never ever had any problems. Partly because I'm a coward and run in middleman mode. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's how. It does. 
I think uh, Len took over maintenance of Mixmaster two years ago. And I've joined him short, shortly later, main, mainly doing maintenance work because the old code was ugly, it still is ugly, but it didn't work as well as it could be. And I think we've done a good job to make it even more stable, not to drop any other message. Yeah. I've also written uh, Binger, which basically is a directory server for anonymous remailers, which collects information about which remailers are out there and makes statistics on how reliable they are, which then in turn use, uh, clients use to make up their chains. And although there has, have been several implementations of Binger's before, I think mine is the best. Partly because, yeah, I mean, 60% market share is something. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I guess a lot of people think that Peter's Pinger is the best, and I'm one of those people. Um, yeah. Just speaking about subpoenas for a minute there, I actually have gotten a, uh, I've gotten a nice subpoena once too, but it was given to me several days after the court appearance stated on the subpoena, so I was able to just shrug and not go to New York. Most federal agents are actually really understanding of the technology and understand that email operators are not the enemy, that they're running the service, and they are they can be as helpful as they can be, and that's about it. I have had some problems with um, FBI agents who don't particularly know much about computers, or websites, or modems, or even what that internet thing is, and, and that becomes problematic when they start hearing lots of techno babble and think you're just lying to them. Um, so it, it's always helpful if you're talking to law enforcement to be speaking to someone who can understand what you're telling them. But uh, yeah, for the most part, this isn't really a talk about abuse, so we can discuss it, but uh, for the most part, the abuses we get are either some corporation is upset about a whistleblower, or there's been a flame war on Usenet and somebody else, somebody called somebody else a doo-doo head, which would have been acceptable under Usenet flame war etiquette, except that they used a remailer, and that is just not acceptable. And usually the people complaining are web TV or AOL users. Uh, I don't know if that's really indicative of anything, but um, it's, a, it's a trend I've noticed. So, do we have any questions from the audience at this point? And do we have a wireless mic? Testing. Testing. <laughs> that's not your question, is it? Uh, the question was, uh, did Bombay Sapphire sponsor this talk? And the answer is no, but it's pretty tasty. Apparently, it's, real the, here? It's, it's the choice okay. of remailer operators everywhere. Well, there's a rumor that uh, the original Mixmaster code was written highly under the influence of Bombay Sapphire, but uh, Peter and I have managed to bring it out of the drunken state that it was in and um, make it much more reliable and, and uh, workable now. We have a question in the front. Do you have any problems with spam? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I have given remailer talks probably four or five, maybe six times now, and every time I turn questions over to the audience. The first question is, the first abuse question is a spam question. It's not about death threats. It's not about kitty porn trafficking. It's not about all these other abuse things that really don't happen. It's about spam. Apparently spam is the most egregious thing that anyone can do on the internet with remailers. And I like that because if that's the worst thing you can do, then we're pretty well off. But no, we're not having problems with spam. Thankfully, we're not. No, we're not. Uh, well, and we won't ever have problems with spam. Uh, yeah, there's uh, problems with Usenet spam certainly coming through, and Usenet trolls. Uh, but the way Mixmaster works, you don't general, or way remailers in general work, you're not going to get uh, a bunch of messages sent out through the system. It'll be somewhat rate limited by virtue of being somewhat slow, and there being easier ways to send spam. And it's only really worthwhile if you're sending it to a mailing list or to a. Uh, uh, mail, it's some sort of multi-person distribution system like a um, uh, Usenet forum. Another issue with spam is that the way anonymity systems work, you need to behave like everyone else using the system. 
If you do anything significantly different than what everybody else is doing, you don't get anonymity. You will stand out. So if you're, if you're spamming Usenet with just one message and that reaches lots of people, you can do it. It works and it's done. If you're spamming via email and you're sending more than a few messages, you will stand out because the majority of users are not sending lots and lots of messages. This also applies to sending large files. The question about trafficking wares and so forth is the same answer as spam. You don't get anonymity with our system because you behave differently. Somebody watching the links can see that you are sending lots and lots of messages into the network and that at some point, lots and lots of messages are coming out and they can correlate that. Yeah. We did actually have a problem recently where there was a Cuban expatriate mailing list that was sending mail primarily by the remailer network, which is awesome and it's like exactly why everyone wants to have a remailer. And I don't know who it was, but somebody posted to the mailing list that the remailer operators use for operational communications saying, somebody must be spamming from this address because they're sending lots of messages through our network. And then the uh, Cuban guy mailed like a couple of days later to the list saying, oh, it's a completely legitimate list. We're doing this for this purpose. And everyone felt pretty bad. So there are problems in some cases with uh, abuse requests or what looks like abuse not really being abuse. and. Um, yeah. Yeah, there have been problems with uh, remailer operators that are less familiar with what their job really is, trying to police and um, expose abusers and actually messing up. One of our esteemed colleagues, the, uh, the, the so-called yeah, sure. frog admin, um, entered this scene by doing just that, stealthily running a secondary mailer in addition to his own and doing traffic analysis on people and out of the legitimate user. Um, luckily, the Cuban case, they were not using the remailer network for the purpose of anonymity, but they were using it to sidestep censorship methods put in place by Cuba that would prevent them from sending directly from their own IP. So actually exposing them didn't really do them any damage, but it could have. So that's a lesson that remailer operators really need to take to heart. Do you have any knowledge of or experience with anyone but a remailer operator ever doing a traffic analysis attack on, the, on a remailer? Or is the existence of such an adversary so far purely theoretical? Uh, I've personally seen, uh, well, I ran a remailer on a network that I assumed had upstream traffic analysis. And the cool thing is a lot of the remailers now are using uh, Start TLS for inter-SMTP protection. So as long as you're running the remailer on a server that has uh, a lot of other mail going through it, you're actually fairly protected from being able to tell that traffic is even going to the remailers. There's basically the state of the network now is there's between 20 and 50 remailers that, that are reliable and public on the internet. And um, you could... You can get some information leaked just from the stats they release, uh, but as long as you remain within the parameters of sending one message every few days, you're probably in a set of people that's internally un un undistinguishable uh, of, I don't know, like maybe 100,000 people or so per period of time, and that's pretty reasonable. I think I personally, if I were trying to run, a, if I were trying to use a remailer, um, if I thought it was actively under investigation, already and my personal local upstream was tapped, I'd be pretty wary of it because being a, one out of uh, 100,000 net users is a substantial reduction in the population of net users. So I might use something like uh, Hotmail to send it or some other thing to inject the message or already encrypted into the network. But um, I think a lot of the most vulnerable traffic analysis of users is really on the uh, the first hop from their local, on their LAN. Uh, and that's where the wiretap orders on users that are already under investigation would be placed. And since we've seen that most of the serious abuse, uh, the, the things that people take seriously are like corporate abuse reporting, a lot of people are kind of dumb and send mail to the remailer network from the office network. So if there's like three employees at your company and you mail um, a remailer from your company and they get mail from another remailer threatening a boss or something, it's pretty obviously the person on the local network who could talk to the, one of the known set of 20 or 50 remailers. So you have to be sort of careful on the first hop into the remailer network. Uh, thankfully, there's a lot of uh, ways to get around that using uh, free web services that do email or using web forms or anything else that uses start TLS or SSL to another address. Yeah, um, if you're worried about traffic analysis, one really clever way to sort of uh, eliminate that issue is run a remailer. Because if you're running a remailer, <laughs> lots of people are sending traffic through your box. 
So send your message from your box and you've got plenty of cover traffic. Uh, that tends to be a method that's overlooked by a lot of users, but the software, thanks to Len and Peter and many other people's efforts, is very easy and approachable now. It's very easy to run it, so if you're concerned about traffic analysis, run a emailer. It's the simplest way to protect yourself from, uh, from somebody figuring out what you're doing. And there are configuration settings for your emailer where it can only really be used as a middleman for traffic, and you would never have any abuse complaints. It wouldn't even be apparent to anyone outside the emailer operator community that you're running a emailer, and you should be fine. Uh, Mid you can run Mid it on a, a low-end modem and you'll be fine. Middleman means that mail is only delivered to other remailers. You, you are a remailer in the middle of a chain, not delivering to the end users. So if there's ever an abuse that goes through your remailer, it's never delivered by your remailer, so no one can see that it came from you and you don't get the complaints. Yeah, middleman is probably best described as a stealth remailer. You're completely out of the loop. Uh, no message will ever come from your box, so no one will ever sue you. Until the revolution comes and they track down all the remailer operators around the world and kill them. And then you must take up arms, my brothers, and fight against them all. I, th I think this is a slightly related question. I'm aware of a couple experiences where people um, link, you know, have websites that, that link you or introduce you into a remailer. And I just think it's important for people to remember that, um, you know, the remailer is only one step. And if they can track back uh, and subpoena the person you know, who had the link, if that link is uh, being logged by the sending message, then you don't have any security either. I don't know that I said that very clearly, but um, if you could elaborate, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, one thing to keep in mind um, with the Type 2 network and, and even the old Type 1 network and, and the, I'm not even going to mention the Type 3 because that code is still being written. Type um, 3 rocks, though. Uh, type it's 3 great. is good. Yeah, it is good. Although we're still debugging it, so technically you shouldn't trust the anonymity. Um, but with the Type 2 network, what you want to do with response to, to her very valid point is you always want to make sure that you're chaining a message, which simply means that you're sending your message through more than one remailer. Um, you never want to send a message through one remailer. You never know. The person operating the remailer may be incompetent. They may be keeping logs. Uh, they may have an agenda. They might want to keep logs. And we know some people who do that. And uh, the bottom line is when you're using the remailer network, the premise that you want to stick with from start to finish is trust no one, trust none of the links. You want to add as many boxes through as many jurisdictions as you can so that you're able to defend against the attacks you just talked about. You, uh, someone will sue, and you don't know how that box is being run. The security of the, the remailer system is based on the premise that you pick a chain, and at least one of the nodes in that chain is honest, or at least that all the nodes in the chain aren't going to collude. If you picked two dishonest nodes, but they're dishonest for different reasons and aren't going to talk to each other, you're about as safe as if one of them really is honest. And that's why you want to run your own remailer. Because the best way to create a chain is hop through your own box. You know your box hasn't been compromised. That's the best way to build a chain. And I'm, I, I really must implore this to everyone in the room. If you really want to do this, run a remailer in middle mode. That's the simplest, easiest, lowest cost way of protecting your anonymity. Run I, a middleman. I hope you've locked down your box, Mike, since saying that at DEF CON <laughs> is just a, a challenge. Now we're going to have like a thousand people join the Remops list. Join the Remops list. I've got a question mostly about Pinger, but one of the problems is when there's 20 or 50 remailers out there, uh, obviously picking from that chain is extremely important. And the way the attack of diluting the number of remailers by setting up 115 myself is something we keep talking about. I don't obviously we don't have 150 remailers, so it's not that popular. But when there's a system like Pinger that says, "Ah, these are the trusted, blessed remailers," don't you think that adds a certain danger? And have you thought about ways of trying to moderate the possibility of somebody outside gaming Pinger? There are a lot of open issues with how chains are selected, how remailers are selected, um, that go far beyond whether someone's actually doing any kind of attack against the directory servers, though that of course makes it worse. Um, this is all not very well understood, but we suspect it's bad. Again, against a global adversary who can watch the entire network and observe all the traffic, there are several statistical attacks that can be done against different people based on which chains they routinely pick or which pinger sites they're going to that rank which remailers at which reliability slot. And 
really it all comes back to you need to behave just like everyone else in the network or you may stand out. But the other side of that is most people, certainly not everyone, but probably most people are not concerned about this global adversary who can monitor the entire network and calculate useful data out of the noise. Most people are concerned about their boss or their spouse or reporting information they know about McDonald's chicken farm abuses or maybe even lower funded governments that don't have these kind of monitoring capabilities. But yes, we strive to be secure against the global adversary. We do not actually meet that because of a lot of these statistical things that I assume people in certain, people who have the ability to be a global adversary probably have much more research on that than the public does. Yeah, if Len, if I can add to that. Um, it's an excellent point that, br that Len brings up. You need to sort of ascertain what the threat is that you're trying to defend against. Um, if you use the uh, military standard to sort of categorize things for information warfare threats, you've got the unstructured threats, which is eh, most people that we would call crackers. Uh, essentially somebody without a budget, a lot of time, uh, then you've got your un you've got your structured threat, which is organized crime, corporations, people with assets, uh, but not necessarily significant assets. They don't have the ability to build an, a global surveillance network. And the last category is your national assets. So if you're dealing with China or Cuba, you're trying to send messages into a country that has significant and tremendous economic and human resources to spend on figuring out where your message came from you've got to do a lot more to defend. So if you're just going to publish uh, a vulnerability in something and you don't want somebody to know that you figured it out, you're one of the developers of the software, well, you know, the threat is the corporation. What can they really do to figure out where you came from? The network is probably secure enough. But if you're talking about the United States of America, eh, the threat's pretty high. And keep in mind, what it is that you're doing. If you're publishing a vulnerability in Microsoft software, eh, the US government doesn't care. And we all know they don't care because they don't patch their software, so they don't care. But if it's something else, like uh, you're trying to undermine the, the government of China, they do have significant assets. So you need to plan accordingly. So paranoia is a good thing, but in measure. I'd be more afraid of a uh, board network administrator for a major backbone than any national government, but yeah. Well, if you're, if, and it's an excellent point you bring up about pingers. Fortunately, thanks to the effort of lots of people, not to mention Peter sitting next to me here, who I think makes the best pinger there is, Echo Lot, um, run your own pinger. Run your own pinger. And that, run your own remailer. And, and I can't stress this enough. Run your own remailer. If you really, really, really need to defend your communications, you should run your own remailer because you know that you control that box to the extent to which you know you control that box, right? And, and of course, and that, that comes... how well do you think you control that box? So if you're clueful and you can really, really, really crank the screws down on that box, you're much better off than you are when you're just looking at a network that, you know, how well do we defend our boxes? Yeah. You shouldn't trust any of us. Yeah. And I... that's the whole point. And of course, running your own pinger does make you different than everybody else too, and you're open to those attacks again as well. Um, but I don't think that... Run your own remailer. I also don't think that's a panacea either. <laughs> but uh, the board network administrator is a threat, but not a threat against the mixed master network, I don't think, given there's just too much data and boredom only motivates one so far. What, I wonder what the remailer operators here think the biggest threat to the remailer operator network is, if, if you want to do that. Well, we, we have a question here that I'm, I want to get to. So. But we'll get back to you. Um, I was I was here actually at DEF CON 8 when you gave that talk and you didn't seem that nervous and it was a great talk and you explained why the system um, has anonymity and it's just possible that not everyone in this room also heard that talk and maybe you want to spend a few minutes explaining why you have uh, circles within circles and why this is a, a pretty sophisticated anonymity system. I mean, I thought maybe you, you remember from that back after the, the law information a, hasn't gone through your head, if Robin remembers. I was just going to say a quick comment. I think there are several uh, thousand people, uh, uh, like in the last couple of weeks, that also realize why we need um, 
strong anonymity from corporations on the internet, like the RIA lawsuits? I'll actually let Len answer this since he's currently the lead of the Mixmaster project. I think it's actually more appropriate for him to answer. <laughs> Len? Okay, mix nets in 60 seconds. So, you want to send an anonymous message. You don't want the source address to be viewable to the person who receives it. So, first thought is send it through a third party proxy. All right, somebody watching the network there after sending this traffic to a third party proxy can see that you're sending it and where it's going to. So, the next step, you add encryption there. You encrypt to the third party. Somebody watching that link doesn't know where it's going to go, and then out it pops at the other end, and hopefully they haven't put two and two together. Chances are they can put two and two together. So what you want to do then is you want to have other people using that third party proxy, and you want the messages to come in and leave in a different order. So messages come in, they're mixed around with other messages, and they come out at different times. So as long as there is a critical mass of traffic, you can't distinguish one from another. You have another problem here, though. You have to trust that proxy. If that proxy is evil or subpoenable, keeps logs, incompetent, and they've been hacked and so forth, you're back to square one. They can monitor things going through, and you're, you don't have anonymity. So what you do then is you chain remailers. You take your message and you encrypt. You set it up so that it's to be delivered to the end user, and you encrypt that to proxy D. And then you take that blob, encrypt it to proxy C, take that blob, encrypt it to proxy or node B, take the last one, encrypt it to node A, then when you send it in, node A strips it away and says, hey, this is for node B, sends it on to node C, strips it away, and so forth. So any individual node knows where it's coming from and where it's going to at next and previous hops. Doesn't know final destination or point of origin. All right that still has an attack against it because people are sending messages of different sizes and you can watch messages go through and figure out who's got what message based on just the sizes of the messages. So you want to make sure that all the messages are uniform. They are split to a fixed size. If they're too small, they're padded. Everything going through is the same size. That's very quickly mixed master. There is another issue here where messages come in and they sit in a message pool which fills up to a certain size before messages are flushed. This is done to prevent an attack where one can flood a node with lots of his own messages and one of the message he wants to watch and then when all those messages come out he just throws out his messages and knows this one message he can't see is the one he wants to follow. So that's a very high level general description of the type of system we're talking about here. Does I anyone think have any? That's the how, but it's still not really the why. And in a nutshell, the why is, you know, back in the day before DNA and fingerprinting, if I wanted to send a letter to Len and didn't want him to know who it came from, I wrote it out. Maybe I even cut things out of the newspaper, whatever. I put it in an envelope and I dropped it in the mail. And current email without, you know, anonymous remailers does not provide that. There is a very nice trail of, you know, which server every single email went through. So I don't really care why I might want to have an anonymous message to Len. The point is I should be able to. And that's, I guess, the three-second version of why. Yeah, the irony is if you want to send anthrax to the United States Congress, you can do that anonymously. But with email, you can't. No one ever yes. sent a bomb through a remailer. True. And it's an excellent point that you bring up there, Len. We're talking about speech. There's a fundamental difference between what you can do through a remailer and what you can do through the mail. All we can do is push speech. That's it. It's just content. We can't send you anthrax. We can't send you a bomb. All we can do is tell you your feet stink or whatever it is you want to say. And ultimately, it's only speech. It's not action. Well, you can also send commands to your uh, bots running throughout the world to like detonate nuclear weapons and stuff through the email yeah, network. Well, but <laughs> we don't want to tell anybody that. Yes. No, but it's a good point. The bottom line is all we can send is data. So for the feds in the room, Ryan apparently has boxes <laughs> that control nuclear weapons throughout the world. Yes, yeah. everyone keep an eye to him on this man. This man right here. Um, Len, there's a guy up here who's got a question, but... Yeah, what's the question? Hey, we have a question here, so I'll take okay, the mic around. Okay, uh, Len, you want to go first? or? Uh... Okay, go ahead. Um, 
Let me tie two of the things together. Uh, somebody mentioned the recording industry subpoenas. Uh, I work at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We're... Uh, give them money. Give them money. Take a bow. Really, yeah. seriously, take a bow. We, we well, really appreciate yeah. what you do. So we, we are worried, obviously, and a lot of these subpoenas, yeah, so we. Uh, we are working on that issue. But it raises an interesting point, which is that, uh, as I understand it, Mixmaster is designed for and optimized to email traffic. A lot of the traffic that requires anonymity today in the network is not necessarily email traffic, and it's not necessarily HTTP traffic. In fact, it's not necessarily any particular higher level protocol traffic. Uh, so my question is, to what extent are the lessons that you all have learned with Mixmaster uh, useful to create a generic TCP proxy, and in particular, a generic distributed network TCP proxy? IP and anonymity. Yes. Yeah, well, let's just say we at the EFF are looking to develop a product like that. So yeah, and we'd love I'm to see it. I'm interested in hearing Yes. It. Download the source from... Uh, uh, it's been done before, not to interrupt uh, Len at all, but uh, ZKS actually started it commercially, and uh, the nobody used it. Nobody used it. So uh, hopefully, thanks to our friends at the RIAA, that might change. Well, it's probably a good thing that nobody used ZKS because th there's two fundamental different architectures for anonymity systems, high latency systems and low latency systems. If you need to have your message, content, whatever, get through the network in a quick manner, you face an entirely different set of challenges than if you're dealing with high latency systems. If I send a message and it takes several hours to get through the remailer network before it gets posted to a mailing list, I really don't care. Email is a low latency system. If I'm browsing the web and it's going to take me a couple hours to get CNN, I care and I'm not going to use it. This all comes back to what will users use. A security system which doesn't have users fails at being secure because it doesn't actually provide security to anyone. With anonymity systems, that point is even more important because if you don't have users, you don't have an anonymity set. The anonymity set is the number of people in a group that all behave the same and can blend with each other. Less users, less anonymity set, a better likelihood that an attacker is going to figure out who you are. So you, we can't have a high latency web browsing system. With the low latency systems, it is much more difficult to beat the type of attacker that we strive to beat in Mixmaster. Is there a use for this sort of thing? Certainly. Is Mixmaster the way to go? Probably not, depending on what you want to do. If you're talking about transferring large bits of data that don't need to get somewhere very fast, yes, it could be as long as there were enough different users doing this that they blended because right now you could use Mixmaster to send 30 meg files but would you stand out? Yes you would because you're pumping in lots and lots of little messages because it's all split down to the same size and out at the other end pops out this big message an attacker just treats the network as a black box and can correlate this. Now if lots of people were doing that it would be different but also they can count the number of packets you're going in and estimate what size the message is going to be when it comes out so the, the moral is you really need to look like everybody else. Yeah, you can play games like trickling in pieces over time, so it looks like you're sending lots of little messages, but it gets much trickier that way. There's... Yeah, let me, let me add to that. The bottom line is you've got to keep in mind who the threat is. So when we're talking about national threats, if we're talking about pushing lots of data through the Mixmaster network versus the United States of America, Eh, you're hosed. I'm sorry, but you are. You're hosed. Unless you really, 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 and I can't stress this enough, really, 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 really know what you're doing. Unfortunately, we don't have enough experience with dealing with that threat, but we do have experience dealing with corporate threats. They do not have the ability to look at the entire network. They for, don't. For a corporate threat like the some, RAA. Some AA ending association. Yes, or the MPAA. It's You'd funny, they all end in AA. Not You'd the Automobile Association. Yes. You would probably want they can't to look see at the whole network. You'd probably want to look at on your routing. That is the most promising a low latency system right now. And you're all going to crush our boxes now with okay. all of your but wares or whatever you're going to push through our boxes. But by the way, the structured threat, the corporations, can't penetrate the network. Thankfully, 
They're not good at it. They can sue the crap out of the people that are running the remailers, and they do do that. That was my next point. If you start running onion routing and it becomes, you know, you overlay Napster on top of it, it doesn't matter if it protects the users if the nodes get sued out of existence. Yes. And believe That's me, why you all need to run remailers. Or you I need to move that? offshore. Did I? Did I mention that already? It, Please, it, start running remailers. Please, because there's only, uh, what are we at right now? 30 some odd remailers? 20. That's 20 for the whole world. That's it. There are 20 people on the entire planet Earth that are running remailers. <laughs> there's a, most of them are the remailer operators are you know in what? this room. Yeah. They're so pretty I, much, I, if a bomb fell on this room, the network would collapse. I, I kid I you an, not. I have an I All have the an, pingers that work would be gone. The list would be gone. I have an important point to add to that, which is that more remailers in our network at this point is detrimental to the anonymity. While that may be counterintuitive, you need to have a balance of users to nodes that the number of users using any individual node is not dilute enough that you can pick out individual traffic. So really, 50 remailers for the amount of traffic we get right now is too many. But there needs to be a critical mass of remailers so that shutting them all down simultaneously is not something that can really happen. And I have to add, though, most of them are in the United States, which is unfortunate. That's not true. Right now, yeah. Yes. Uh, no, there's about a more than quarter to a third in the U.S. Uh, more. No, more than that. Yeah, there's no. more than that, unfortunately. Um, Keep in mind, most of those operators don't want to tell you where they live. Uh, most of the remailers are, so the majority of remailers are in the U.S. and Germany. If we lost the U.S. and Germany right now, we'd be Which in trouble. Which is not hard to do. We could lose the U.S. and be fine. Seeing as how Germany has a law against certain types of speech. Uh -huh. Germany is also more private. Privacy friendly. Oh, than, I uh, concur. The US. Yeah, but keep in mind the bottom line is we don't have enough diversity in the network. The people that I think would do the most good for the remailer network would be people building applications on top of anonymity that right. would bring a large number of users and a large amount of interest to the network, not necessarily people running servers. That, which that is key. Getting more users is the key point. Yeah. Once and we have more users, then we have the strong anonymity, then we can start yeah. thinking about it. We can and learning from what we have. I mean, keep in mind, we've got a lot of people that are trying to build infrastructures for anonymity, and they aren't looking at the anonymous remailer network. We've been doing this for a long, long, long time, and we've been attacked. We've been sued a lot, and this young man right here can has got to answer his question. But the bottom line is, you know, we've got to learn from what we've already done. Um, we've figured out most of the attacks that we're going to run into, and most of them are structured attacks. So this man right here has a question. So it was mentioned earlier that you have not had a problem with spam in any sense, but have you had a problem with viruses at all? Or anything like that? Personally, of spam? spam, no. Viruses, yes. Uh, viruses, well, the biggest problem actually is HTML content, thanks to the wonderful mail user agents that everyone runs called Outlook, not to bash Microsoft, which I think is unfair, but speaking to the largest volume of users out there, they use Outlook. It's HTML mail, so it's attacks against that, and we see a tremendous volume of those sorts of attacks uh, against those users. No, not really, because the network isn't very good for that. No, nah, it's, it's not a good network. The, the latency is too low, and it's too hard to use the network. Hi. Um, going back to what you were saying about needing more users, one of the things that I think would bring more users on would be more NIM servers. Possibly, or maybe oh God. NIM servers yes, you know, more well yeah. known. To right. People. The only problem is the NIM servers right now essentially rely on Type One technology. Right. There are a lot of there's a lot of work being and done on. We're fixing that. How to improve NIM servers? Type Three will introduce new ways of doing NIM servers. NIM servers need to be more reliable and easier to use. Currently, sure. what we have in place is a proof of concept that isn't really ready for prime time. Since you'd like to have more people using the network, um, what kind of clients are available? I think I used something a long time ago called Private Idaho. Is there any other client that uh, you would suggest? Yeah, My Private Idaho was, well, go ahead. It's go ahead. not really ideal right now. The, a lot of the code that runs on Windows is not as actively maintained as the code that runs on Unix. If you're running a, uh, a Unix client for your mail, you can easily just use the Mixmaster binary to do all your stuff for you, and it integrates well with a lot of mail user agents like Mutt, the one that sucks but sucks less, or Pine or other miscellaneous mail user agents. Yeah, the but geek for Windows, factor is high. It's, yeah. 
Yeah, the geek factor is high. I mean, if you're really worried about your anonymity, not to blow Len and Peter's horn here, but you need to kind of stick with the Unix code, unfortunately, right now. The Windows code is not as actively maintained. Well, there is one. So, Private Idaho isn't maintained anymore. There was Jack B. Nimble and Jack B. Nimble 2, which were written by somebody who went by a, a pseudonym known as R Process, and he disappeared without any explanation. Um, we don't know what happened to him. That code isn't maintained anymore. There is a Windows client called Quicksilver, which is actively maintained and is a GUI, a GUI um, overlay on top of Mixmaster. On OS 10, Mixmaster runs natively. Yeah, Quicksilver is very good for, for the Windows platform. But if you're really paranoid, you're going to have to stick with the latest Mixmaster code. If you're not, and Quicksilver uses 2.9 beta 12. Is that it right now? There are no security problems with that. I'm not it's complaining. Just I think of, it's great. Yeah. I'm just saying of, if you're uh, that paranoid. Yeah. If you're not that paranoid, there are like web forms that will submit to the Remail Network and it'll give you a reasonable amount of anonymity, especially if you're just sending test messages that are not that Rely, rely yeah, make sure if you're using the web remailers that they have SSL support and you understand that means that the web interface could be logging the message, the IP address, and where it was going. Right. In order to get full security, you need to do the encryption operations on your trusted machine. Yeah, using the web, web interface, you're trusting the web interface. Are there any legal questions here for, uh, for the lawyer on the panel? Maybe if you could go into the Patriot Act a little bit more, and maybe it's a big law, the Patriot Act, and like when they subpoenaed you, and they invoked that, like what did they say? Like exactly what? Law do you want to know from experience, or do you want to hear from a lawyer what you should say? Yeah, from experience, the answer is, hey, guess what? I don't have any logs. From the lawyer, the answer is, call my attorney, right? The unfortunate hunting answer is, if you're curious about the Patriot Act, please see Cindy Cohen's talk tomorrow, right? Cindy, please stand up. Cindy is a marvelous EFF attorney talking about the Patriot Act tomorrow. That's the EFF row right there, folks. Everyone give them a round of applause. And the other EFF attorney talking tomorrow. Please stand up, Miss Wendy Seltzer. Yeah, and by the way, this young lady rules. Thank God for them. To the man that keeps saying to get more of these out there, why why don't you tell us why the ISPs dislike you won't allow them on their systems, or the hosts won't allow them on their systems? They'll throw you off. So how are you going to get more? Well, if you want my two cents, the, the why did the ISPs do it? I can only infer. I don't know. I don't run Having an ISP. Run an ISP. Actually, yeah, yeah. Actually, he might okay. be the better person to answer the question. Having run an ISP, your margins are pretty small, and remailer operators sort of, uh, if they cause one complaint, you don't make any money off of that dial-up customer for the next year. So it's really just a pure practical, these people cost you money and are slightly annoying and potentially liability. People don't really understand the potential liability for the ISPs because it's not really defined yet, and they're just afraid, so they are on the side of protecting their revenue. Having also been in the ISP business, um, it does not make economic sense to allow remailers to run on DSL lines and so forth if there's you know, a low-cost service. However, ISPs are perfectly happy to let you run your remailer if you're a Colo customer or a T1 customer or anyone who's paying a significant amount for bandwidth. Then the cost per abuse case isn't an issue. But if you're going to run a remailer, my suggestion, well, this is what I did. I set up my remailer in middleman mode and ran it for a month. There were no problems there, of course, because I wasn't, there weren't any abuse complaints, and I was not exceeding my traffic. I made sure that everything was, was fine. Then I went to the abuse department, and I said, hey, I've set up this remailer. I'm running it. I'm going to turn it on in full mode. If you ever get any abuse complaints, the, the headers say to send abuse to me, but if ever they get sent to you guys, just forward them to me. I'll take care of them right away. They said, thanks for telling us. We'll do that. Uh, once or twice, I... Uh, a year, I get somebody complaining to the ISP, usually because they got called a doo-doo head on Usenet, and the abuse department at the ISP forwards it on to me, and I handle it, and it's not a problem. If you go and surprise your ISP by setting up a remailer, and they get this abuse complaint, and it's something particularly nasty that's forwarded, they may just shut you down because they don't know what's going on, they think you might be doing the abuse, and so forth. But having a dialogue with your ISP is important. They are usually friendly to this sort of thing. The ISP community is very open to this. Yeah, the key, and uh, Len is right, the key is if you've got an ISP, you want to call the help desk, get elevated to, you know, tier two or tier three, get to the Clueful people and tell them what you're doing. 
I've done that, and it works. Bottom line is, your ISP may not agree with it. So if you're worried about abuse, go middleman. That goes back to my point of if you're worried about traffic analysis, run a middleman. Run it through your box. You know you control that. Okay, we're out of time here, so I'm going to ask our panelists to sum up their thoughts on their experiences running remailers, and then uh, we will wish you a good day. Robin. The quick thing I can add about ISPs, uh, what I did was I was a university student at a state university. State universities are bound by this thing called the First Amendment. <laughs> Um, I checked into the AUP at my university and it basically said, we're not really going to censor you because that would be against the First Amendment. So as long as what you're doing isn't illegal, you can do whatever you want to. So I ran a remailer. And anytime there were any kind of complaints, I said, not my department, First Amendment. And surprisingly, they said, okay. Now I'm sure this was helped by being a law student and being very persistent. But if any of you are actually interested in running a remailer and are state university students with good AUPs, please talk to me. I have lots of experience in this. Last two points. Number one, if you run a remailer, thou shalt not keep logs, any logs. Rule number two, do not edit any content ever. Feel free to ask me later why. Yeah. Um, my experience in running remailers, remailers basically is roughly the same, but I usually run the ISP that's running the remailer, so um, it makes it kind of fun to deal with abuse complaints because you get to like laugh at people. Um, the, the thing that I think is going to help the remailer network the most is there's going to be some NIM server improvements coming along pretty soon. I have a paper at a conference where I'm sort of working on a NIM server that's going to be really good. Um, and if real applications for the remailer network emerge where you're doing mailing list software that uses remailers or you're doing various forms of computer software that interact over the remailer network, that would be awesome. We'll build up the traffic volume greatly and then more people want to remail run remailer networks and everyone will be happy. And now that we have a real threat from the M RAA and MPAA as opposed to the sort of vague government threat, um, people have much more incentive to actually use this technology. So uh, hopefully the next three or four years are going to be like the last three or four years only actually happen. Yeah, I have to just add to that. Uh, actually, I sat on uh, and founded the committee at the university I worked at that actually created the AUP. And uh, I can't stress that enough. If you're a university student, look into your AUP. Uh, if your AUP will allow you to do it, run a remailer. Um, a lot of universities are very positive and supportive of that, and ours was, probably because of me, but no, no short measure due to everyone else and the fact that we actually codified it. And a lot of universities are very supportive of that. If you're a user, everyone in this room is, use the network. Every single person that sends anything through the network helps everyone else, even if it's just a dummy message, if it's nothing, if it's just junk. You are helping everybody else that has something important to say through the network. And you know what? We don't have enough remailer operators. We lose them. Len is right. If we have a lot of remailer operators, we end up with a problem. But we don't have enough good long-term operators. Well, my remail is running in a university network as well. And I did ask them, and all they told me is, well, we cannot allow you to run a new remailer which was good enough for me because they didn't forbid me to run the remailer. <laughs> and so, so it's been running for three years and I hope it stays that way. So just as a brief closing note, those of you who are interested in being users, and please be users, if you're going to say, I don't need anonymity, we're the kind of users you want because this needs to be a legitimate network for legitimate use. Go to mixmaster.sf.net Grab the code if you run Unix or OS X or Linux. If you want a Windows client, you can go to skuz.net, S-K-U-Z dot N-E-T slash Quicksilver and download the Quicksilver client, which is a somewhat difficult to learn UI, but a good interface to Mixmaster. That'll get you started using it. And please, anyone who has any questions about this or any further interest, we are around during DEF CON. Find one of us. We're more than happy to help. One of the best things for the Remailer Network is evangelism. As Mike said, his university was pro-Remailer because of him. That's largely what happens. Somebody comes in and makes this an advocacy point, and then you can turn an institution into being a pro-anonymity, pro-Remailer community, whereas they wouldn't have been otherwise. So thank all of you for coming. Thank those of you who want to help for helping, and have a good day. Thank you.